So <clears throat> this is a response to Benjamin Boyce's claim to be a postmodernist. I laid this out a little bit in the first video of the series. And now I really want to get into it and lay out a more detailed argument for why I don't think he's a postmodernist. Um, it took me a long time to put this together, not reflected in the state of my hair, but hopefully reflected in the organization of my ideas and how I'm going to roll them out. Uh, it took me like more than a week to put together the script that I am currently not reading. Uh, but that gives me some sense of security just knowing that it's right over there and I could read it if I need to. Um, but I'm, I'm, I need that time to process the ideas and organize them. And I work six days a week, more than eight hours a day. And in addition to that, I'm a father and a husband and I, I have to have duties um, of a family man that I need to uphold and that are very meaningful to me to uphold. Um, so, you know, I, I had to put this together working in the wee hours of the morn before the sun rises, you know, before I, before I go to work. Um, uh, and not, you know, it's not easy. Uh, but anyway, all right, I'm going to start by summarizing Benjamin Boyce's, um, position as far as I've understood it from the video that he did with another YouTuber named Vocal Distance or called Vocal Distance. Um, that video will now appear floating over my head in a little gray bar and you can click on it or you could wait till the end of this video and click on it in the uh, description. I'm going to link the video to the description and it is a great conversation. If you're interested in, um, if you're interested in postmodernism, you should watch that video. It's, it's a, it's a really interesting conversation. Vocal distance uh, is, you know, going for the jugular attacking postmodernism. And Benjamin Boyce puts up this interesting argument that, uh, where he, he's sort of pushing back a bit and, uh, and, and he goes out and he says that he is a postmodernist. So he highlights two, um, two main aspects of postmodernism that he sees either as good things or as neutral things with the potential for good use. These two aspects of postmodernism are deconstruction and something that I'm going to refer to as cultural hodgepodge. The latter term, cultural hodgepodge, is a term I came up with. It's not what Boyce calls it. Um, so let's start with a more familiar of those two terms, deconstruction. Deconstruction in this context is generally understood as the deconstruction of the meta narrative. And the meta narrative, of course, is the interpretation of external events into some sort of internalized story, some sort of story that we tell ourselves to explain the world around us. So in this definition, Christianity is a meta narrative. And so is the idea that like democracy inevitably will, you know, emerge as the victorious sort of political organizing, uh, you know, ideology of the world. Uh, in academic circles, that latter narrative is referred to as the grand narrative. Deconstruction seeks to break these narratives down through analysis, usually by picking at the weak spots in the arguments and poking at the inconsistencies until the whole thing just falls apart. Boyce seems to be saying that this is not inherently a bad thing to do. I think it's safe to say that you know, he, he is deconstructing the woke arguments. So, um, you know, in that sense, deconstruction is like a good tool to have in the tool belt. Um, yeah, I mean, it's precisely what he's doing with wokeness, right? He's carefully and rigorously deconstructing woke arguments. The thing is uh, that this, this kind of deconstruction is really nothing new. It's basically an application of the Socratic method. Um, so, I don't think we should attribute the invention of what's termed deconstruction to postmodernism. Their contribution in this regard is better understood as one of affect and attitude. It's their attitude that everything should go undergo deconstruction and nothing can withstand scrutiny. So when Wokel calls postmodernism nihilistic, that's what he's referring to and Postmodernism carries out this focus on deconstruction to an extreme degree. To a degree, in fact, 
that prevents the building of anything positive. It will not permit anything to be posited. Contrast that with Plato, who gives us the Socratic method in his recounting of Socrates. Plato had a balance of both deconstruction and construction. He's constantly positing things, erecting theses and hypotheses. Um, I'm emphasizing this because I think people don't understand the degree to which something as simple as a mere attitude, um, something, I mean, an attitude is something amorphous, right? It's hard to pin down. Uh, something as simple as a mere attitude can make a seismic shift in an intellectual paradigm. People tend to think that the definitive aspects of a movement must be found in the structural components, the nuts and bolts of how it functions. And it's easy to grossly underestimate the, dis the degree to which mere attitude plays a huge part in the shaping and defining of a movement. <clears throat> so that's my first contention. If you think you're a postmodernist because you appreciate the proper applicability of deconstruction in certain contexts, you're off base on your assumption of what the key definitive aspects of postmodernism are. Deconstruction is nothing new. Now, I know that postmodernism involves a lot more than just deconstruction. There's this whole thing about semantics and the very interesting conversation about how words take on their meanings, as well as this interesting thing of equating language with power. Uh, fascinating subject to look into. And, um, and those definitely contribute to this overall sense of what postmodernism is. And Wokel and Benjamin Boyce did touch on those aspects in their conversation. And it, it's, it's really fascinating. You should go watch it. Um, but I'm not going to get into that because it wasn't clear to me that Benjamin Boyce voiced any particular support for that aspect of postmodernism. So I'm looking more at the aspects that he's uh, sort of using as a basis for the claim to be a postmodernist. So let's, let's move on now to that other thing, what I refer to as the cultural hodgepodge. First off, I want to say that there is a danger in letting academics define things for us. Um, and, uh, you know, at least uh, letting them be the sole arbiters and gatekeepers of words and their meanings. How, how postmodern of me, right? <laughs> but, um, I mean, you know, look what they've done with the term postmodern. All these academics have put forward all these various, you know, they've written so much about it. And, and made it a, a pretty confusing term by defining it in, in sort of different ways. So it, within the humanities and social sciences, it, postmodernism has a different connotation, means sort of a different thing than it does in the visual arts. So I want to I sort of look at that relationship. And in particular, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to start off looking uh, at how it's usually uh, taught in, in the visual arts. Um, and uh, that, tie, that, that goes back to architecture. Let me find where I am in my script here. So, um, yeah, so, so there's this divergent, they've taken di postmodernism, the meaning and definition of postmodernism ha has taken divergent paths in the arts as compared with, you know, like the humanities, uh, science, uh, social science and philosophy. And um, so in the arts, that's where we really see this, this aspect what, that I'm calling the cultural hodgepodge. And it is not cultural syncretism. Uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce syncretism. I'm sure I heard it, you know, pronounced in anthropology classes I took in college. But um, syncretism is, um, it, it's just basically a, a fancy schmancy uh, technical term to that anthropologists use to describe cultural blending when different aspects of a culture, whether it's a practice a belief or, you know, visual art or, or whatever, uh, when, when those things blend, <clears throat> it's a very natural process. You can see it literally happening everywhere all the time throughout all eras of human history. All right. Now I'm starting to get annoyed by my hair. Oh, well, it is what it is. A contemporary example of, um, of syncretism, uh, syncretism, I suppose, would be the mixing of visual styles and practices associated with the U.S. celebration of Halloween and the Mexican celebration of Dia de los Muertos. Uh, my favorite, uh, my favorite U.S.-Mexican cultural hybrid is uh, 
the California burrito, which uh, I, I'm very partial to as a, as a Californian. It's a wonderful, wonderful example of uh, syncretism here in California. It is carne asada with French fries in a burrito, just a beautiful example of high cuisine that we have here. Um, <clears throat> more, a more ancient example of syncretism would be Greek art styles blending with early Buddhist imagery, uh, of which there are numerous examples from the ancient Greco-Bactrian kingdoms of what is today Afghanistan. Another example of uh, the influence of, you know, in art history or in ancient art or somewhat ancient art history would be, um, you can see a lot of influence from Chinese painting styles on the painting style of Persia during the Safavid period, which is roughly like 1500s through the 1700s. Um, and I just wanted to make a shout out to my all time favorite Persian painter, Reza Abbasi. He is a badass and you guys should check him out. Um, but anyway, you know, syncretism is, um, is like, I'm just trying to make the point that it, it's nothing, there's nothing particularly postmodern about syncretism. And it's actually quite a different thing uh, for a lot of different reasons. And it, it's, it's super normal, super natural. It doesn't need any special explanation. It's the obvious result of two cultures interacting. And it is categorically different than what postmodern artists are doing when they engage in what I'm calling the cultural hodgepodge. So a lot of people, to get a good idea of what the hodgepodge is, um, a lot of people trace it back in the visual arts to a book titled Learning from Las Vegas, which was written by a trio of architects in 1972. If you think about Las Vegas, it's the perfect exemplar of this hodgepodge style. Postmodernists just took an unconscious, unself-aware version of this hodgepodge, which was sort of naturally occurring in Vegas following its own cheesy trajectory. They took this and they turned it into a hyper-aware, ironic version. <clears throat> and that is where we see the biggest difference between the cultural hodgepodge and authentic cultural syncretism. The postmodern cultural hodgepodge is flippant, cynical, ironic, and self-aware. Oh, so self-aware. Um, syncretism is, is more sincere. Syncretism is this genuine feeling of, okay, this works well for this, and that works well for that. Let's just combine them so I can have the best of both worlds. Um, cu cultural hodgepodge is more like, Dude, nothing means anything anyway. Let's just make this big neon Frankenstein. Ha, ah, isn't that funny? So it's a kind of decadence. There's a kind of decadence in it. It's self-aware in that it knows what it's doing looks comical. It channels that comedy into a cynical kind of irony where everything becomes laughable, a laughable caricature of itself. This again ties into the nihilism that Wokel referred to. The flippant attitude towards traditional aesthetic forms is possible because it's an expression of the intrinsic meaninglessness of those forms. The postmodern architects are stripping those forms of their traditional meanings. They're saying, hey, look, there's nothing inherent about this that makes it, you know, that, that gives it a meaning. I'm free, therefore, to use it in any way I see fit. And in fact, I'm gonna use it in this way that flies in the face of the aesthetic dictates of modernism. Now, modernism claimed that all things must be functional and reduced to their essential sort of function. So clean lined, clean edged, devoid of any traditional aesthetic forms. And postmodernists are getting around this by not by reclaiming the inherent value of those traditional aesthetic forms, but rather by flaunting both the modernist dictates as well as their traditional dictates, by divorcing these traditional forms of any sense of meaning or dignity that they possessed in their original contexts, and, uh, and, and sort of recombining them in these ridiculous uh, ways. So this simultaneous, I mean, like, they're simultaneously l laughing in the face of the modernists and the pre-modern styles, which just comes across as, 
oh, so subversive, of course. You know, being subversive is the highest aim of the postmodernist because it's very cool to be subversive, right? So if you want to draw a parallel between the way postmodernism operates in art and the way that it operates in the social sciences and humanities, then it is best understood this way. The thread that links them together is that they each cast a huge amount of shade on any attempt to make a meaning in, in a positive sense, to make a positive meaning. They seek to smash anything that attempts to be sincere, noble, dignified, or possessing of gravitas. The intellectual atmosphere on planet postmodernia is hostile to any life of that sort. Um, the attitude and affect of postmodernism is like a poison gas cloud to any form of life that breathes the, you know, lives upon, you know, takes its life and its vitality from the air of sincerity. Okay. So uh, I just painted a very dark picture here of, uh, of the postmodern postmodernism and the postmodern hodgepodge phenomena. Um, and of course, you know, that makes it sound like it's a sinister evil plot intentionally cooked up to destroy the good, the true, and the beautiful. And of course, that's not really true 100% of the time. Um, I've read passages from Learning from Las Vegas, for instance, that, that book I talked about. Uh, I've read patches, passages from it that I liked and even kind of agreed with in, in some sense. And so I think it's better to understand the postmodern hodgepodge style as a reaction to those narrow, strict constraints uh, that modernist and the modern modernism and the modernist style in architecture uh, had sort of imposed at, at that point in history with this sort of no nonsense, no frills attitude. Uh, this 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 thing that makes modernist architecture so often so boring and dull and uninspiring. So while I do believe that the hodgepodge style does lead back inevitably to cynical irony, it is in many cases a corollary effect more than an overt and intentional one. You could easily interpret many aspects of postmodern architecture as an expression of innocent whimsy. It's possible, um, a possible example of this would be Frank Gehry's architecture. His approach to design seems to revel in a lighthearted, whimsical playfulness. And while it's not really my cup of tea, it is better than the utilitarian modernist nightmare. And I certainly wouldn't paint Gehry as a satanic figure who's out to corrupt all that is good and noble in the world. I guess if you want to, if you want to take a, uh, I shouldn't say that all modernist architecture is bad. There is a contemporary uh, architect named Richard Meyer, who probably some idiots would classify as a postmodernist, although he, he's totally a modernist. He's just a modernist who happens to live in postmodernist times. He's got a contemporary example of the modernist ideal. And anyone who's been to Los Angeles and been to the Getty Center, uh, that beautiful museum up on a hill. We'll see, I think, you know, um, what I mean by, you know, he, he's, he's, he, he, he makes a good version of the modernist aesthetic. So uh, I don't want to, you know, also say, you know, go too far and say that modernist architecture can't be, can't be good too. It, it can. Um, I don't, I don't go in for like Le Corbusier or, you know, some of these, uh, these old examples that are heralded, heralded, cannot speak, that are pointed to as great examples of what modernist architecture should be. I think Le, Le Corbusier was a piece of shit and nothing he made really stands out to me as, you know, wonderful. Although I can see why it looked, you know, very challenging in his time. Um, but, um, God, you know what? What a sidetrack. Let's get back to it. Where are we here? Where are we here? I'm just trying not to be black and white about this whole thing, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. So I wanted to say, okay, so I've been focused on architecture, but my, my personally, I mean, I'm a painter. And so, you know, I wanted to mention how the, you know, how this aspect of postmodernism comes up in visual arts that are not architecture. And uh, the hodgepodge aspect 
<clears throat> that I've been looking at is less noticeable in the aggregate when we look at postmodern art in painting, sculpture, installation, and all that other kind of stuff. Um, but what does come forward immediately is the element of cynical irony. There is a heavy emphasis on the political dimension of art that grows and tracks alongside the development of the critical theories throughout the last 50 years. So um, I'll get massively sidetracked if I follow this thread. So I'm just going to save it for a later video. But to draw a tight correlation between postmodern art and postmodern architecture, um, I, I, would, I would point to Jeff Koons. And um, you have the same, with Jeff Koons, you have the same coin where on one side, there is this lighthearted, playful whimsy. You could look at his balloon animal sculptures. Uh, and then on the other side, there's that sort of cynical irony that seems to preclude the possibility of anything truly lofty or high in the classical sense. <clears throat> So, okay, so I think I've sufficiently laid out my case for a firm and clear distinction between the honest, sort of sincere, universalist approach towards culture versus the postmodern cultural hodgepodge. I didn't get into cultural relativity, but that is also implicated in this conversation, and maybe I can get into that in a future video. There is a connection between cultural relativity and postmodernism, uh, but just as with spiritual universalism, I, and by the way, I'm calling this spiritual universalism to distinguish it from universalism in philosophy, which has a more strict uh, definition that I'm not so familiar with. But I'm talking about spiritual universalism as sort of just this idea that, you know, you, you kind of go with this sort of open mind to different, to, to evaluate different sort of um cultural institutions or, or which which often in the traditional world center around some sort of spiritual or religious you know uh, worldview right so I'm calling that spiritual universalism which Benjamin Boyce did sort of refer to in you know sort of being able to experience sort of this core um, experience this 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 sense of taking in the the experience of divine through you know these these various, these various sort of religions um, and trying to see the kernel at, at the core of them all, right? So <clears throat> there's, what I'm trying to say is that the, um, there, there is a connection between that and cultural relativity and cultural rel relativity does have a sort of a connection with postmodernism, but it's not a, it's not a causal relationship. It's not like this came about because of that. It's more just that like, because postmodernism had this sort of uh, enabling effect on those things which already existed in our in our culture before postmodernism. They they sort of fed it. They 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 enhanced it, but they didn't really cause it, right? Uh, and 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 that's fascinating to go into. I'd love to go into the you know the roots of the universalist approach, right? Which I mentioned uh, in my first video in this series. I mentioned a little bit about that. Okay, so that's it. Benjamin Boyce. Uh, how similar is this cultural hodgepodge to the honest, sincere form of syncretism or Unitarian Universalist approach that you described in your conversation with Wokel? I don't think it's related at all. If postmodernism cleared the space for the spiritual universalists of like the 1960s, for instance, um, the cultural flexibility that facilitated this development was a mere byproduct byproduct of postmodernism's functioning, not its end goal. Postmodernism doesn't want you to go from the synagogue to the mosque, then the Hindu temple to find God in each one behind a different mask. Classical postmodernism wants to deconstruct all of those places. It wants to deconstruct God. That's probably what it wants more than anything. Um, and so neither deconstruction nor syncretism or spiritual universalism have roots in postmodernism. All existed in some form since antiquity. All right, what say you, Benjamin Boyce? I would love to hear your uh, response to these ideas. And um, of course, I'm throwing this all out there just because I think they're interesting. I think you might be interested. I think other people who are interested in postmodernism will be interested in this. But of course, I deeply appreciate uh, uh, Benjamin Boyce and uh, what he brings to bear in this conversation. 
My next video on postmodernism is going to try to classify it into three distinct stages uh, through its historical progression over these last 50 years or whatever. And I think that will help a lot in our efforts to define postmodernism more precisely. If you want to stay abreast of my activity, please like and subscribe. Bye for now.